you described this play as bringing up baby meets Doctor Who. That's right. So explain what the play is about. Oh, okay. So first let me just say one sort of cloudy day, I had nothing to do, which is extremely rare. So I was just walking down Fifth Avenue and went past my favorite bookstore. And there in the rack was a children's book that had the most extraordinary drawings of women's hats, turn of the century. So I felt like this kind of explosion went off in my head. Um, I was like, feathers, women's hats, turn of the century, birds. Where did they get all those feathers from? So that moment in time led me on a year and a half chase to track down the history of fashion at the turn of the century and how that related to the conservation movement um, in terms of the extinction of birds and what it took to stop women from putting feathers on their hats. So this play, Birds of a Feather, a comedy about the extinction was born from that moment in time. Um, so it was really, I, I went on this kind of really wonderful historical and contemporary journey. Because at the same time, I was kept reading about the extinction, which is fascinating. I don't know if people know about it, but the idea of bringing back the passenger pigeon or the woolly mammoth or some of the creatures that no longer walk the earth. I mean, this is pretty radical stuff. And so I was reading about that and reading about turn of the century conservation and, and the women's movement, and it all came together for me in this play. And it's set... I, I think, against the backdrop of the suffragette? It is. So what began to happen for me is as I was studying early conservation movement, I began to see how it related to the women's movement of the time, the suffragettes. Um, and so I sort of had this two-track research, you know, happening for myself. One was looking at the suffragette movement, mostly centered in New York City at that time, and then the other was the conservation movement. So I want to say that actually, Everything in this play is historically accurate, except for one tiny small thing that we don't time travel yet. <laughs> and there's a convention in the play where the main character travels through time. Um, but yeah, no, it's a fascinating history that people don't know about. Um, so I'm really, I'm so excited to try to at least capture a little piece of this history in this play. Would you call it a political play? Would you call it a feminist play? Would you call it both? I wouldn't call it either um, because I don't want to box it. Um, the play is about what the play is about. Um, and I want people to watch the play and get what they get from it. Um, yes, it certainly gets into some politics of the time in terms of suffragette history. Yes, it gets into conservation politics of the time. But honestly, my goal in writing this play was to have a lot of fun um, to give the audiences a sense of these really, really interesting characters that I think I created, and then maybe the takeaway being, hmm, let me think about this for a while. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but that was my intention in writing this play. Well, and when you look at voting rights, and you oh, look yes. at voters' rights, voting rights here in the state of North Carolina, Absolutely. it seems kind of timely and relevant. Um, yes, it does. I'll just <laughs> tell folks that, you know, the entire, most of the second act um, takes place um, in a particular, about a particular event that happened in New York City, which was the first women's nighttime march, suffragette march. You know, now we take for granted that, that women go out and march at night. That had never been done before in the United States. And that was the first time, and the entire second act sort of unfolds against, you know, a, a, around that event. Um. And Brooke, as a performer, as an actor in this play reading, what, um, why do you, you're also a playwright yourself. Mm -hmm. So what is it about new plays, new work, new voices? And June's not a new voice because she's written, you know, 13. You can call me old. I'm good on that. <laughs> I, I, I own it. Well, I own and, it. I, and I'm not saying old, but you're not a new play, no. right? You've written. This is my, Birds is my 13th full length, and I recently just finished my 14th full length. 
So what is it about um, new work that you find so exciting? I mean, it's the opportunity, especially with a staged reading, is, is an opportunity to really, um, first of all, kind of cr help create a character, um, be like, well, it's exciting to be the first voice of a character. Um, and it's also exciting to be part of the process of creating um, a work because I mean, I, I don't know about you, but certainly for me, like the staged reading process is definitely not the end of the journey for oh, a play, no, you know, <laughs> that like you, what, like w if you give what you can to give a voice to the character and give um, thoughts to the character, that lets the author Absolutely. listen to it and say, okay, that's working. Maybe that isn't working. Finding, like, when you hear it, like, mm -hmm. I know about you, but when I hear it, it's like you you hear, like, okay, like, this clicks. Or maybe sometimes you even say, like, oh, this is how the sh this scene needs to be shaped. Um, and that's a service that we as actors can give to, to um, writers. Mm -hmm. um, and it's always really exciting to be part of that process because, yeah, you are, I mean... I don't know if this is the first stage reading. This, this no. isn't. This isn't. It's right. It's a stage reading um, in New York City. Right. And yes. then um, it got picked up and won Festival 51 in Rhode Island where, where it was workshopped. Right. So this is sort of its. And I. I, Third I, I have, iteration. This is about 100. Draft 150. Right. No, no, I'm not exaggerating. No, this I is believe draft you. 150. I you. Yeah. Um, so this is. I've never heard this draft. Right, exactly. Yeah. And it's like you. they, they always say, like, what, like. Uh, um, plays or, or writing is never finished. It's just abandoned. <laughs> so, so I can't take it anymore. It's like, yeah, just like, okay, that's good enough, you know. But but it really okay. is. It's, it's exciting to be part of that process because yeah, this is the first time you've you've heard exactly. this draft, draft and getting to hear it and getting to be part of that process okay. and is getting to help you and is getting to help create awesome. something new. I mean, which is really really exciting. And what do you hope? So June, what have you? gotten from what what was the takeaway for you from the sta other stage reading the workshop of this and what do you hope to get out of this particular stage that's a reading? really great question you know i've been working on this play for a few years you know people think plays just spring fully formed um and once in a while they do but 99 percent of the time you know it's literally 200 rewrites um and exactly what he's talking about in terms of that process i tape every reading i go back i listen to it over and over and over again and i i do what a playwright does which is make it better based on what i've heard based on this isn't working that isn't working this can be sharpened that joke doesn't work anymore i will say when i first my first draft of this play Dare I say, it had some Trump jokes, but it was before he had become president. <laughs> so, you know, I, some people don't find tr Trump funny, so I've had to remove all of those jokes. I had to literally clean some of the jokes out because they, because time, in a very short period of time, some things had changed. So, you know, the process, you know, what I hope to get out of this reading um, is, th this is sort of my, I'm into the final edit stage now. Because um, it's been, you know, sort of a two-year journey of this reading and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the, you know, sections of the play have already been picked up for publication. Um, but I'm still sort of working on some sections. So my hope is this is, I'm going into the final drafts now. This is the next set of rewrites is the final drafts. You know, you always tweak, yeah, yeah. you know, once you get into a full production. But uh, I, I feel like I'm, I'm up to that point now. And when do you kind of as playwrights to both of you because i think people are very unfamiliar with the process you yeah. go to see a finished product and you think oh this you know just all of a sudden mm -hmm. sprung onto the page <laughs> and here's a finished product right. but in the evolution of a play when do you kind of know okay we're kind of done with this development process mm -hmm. and now it's ready for a full production um, or do you ever know that i <laughs> i get a feeling I know that sounds so woo-woo, you know, talking about feeling, but you hear it, you say to yourself, you know, that's working. And it doesn't mean I'm an obsessive rewriter. I mean, I am, you know. I, you know, I hear a play from long ago, and I'm like, ah, oh, damn, I should have fixed that line, you know. So, but, in the, but in the end, you, you, I think you get a feeling. It's like, that's working. And then you get audience feedback. You know, you never, 
I don't yet generally write comedies, very rarely. Um, the play before this was the darkest play I'd ever written. Across the Holy Tell is about two women and their friendship in Iraq and what happens to them and their families. It's not a happy story, I'm afraid. So after that, I'm like, oh my God, I want to write something fun and funny, but still with content. Um, and you know that in New York, at the first reading of you know earlier drafts, and people were laughing all night, you kind of know, I'm like, Oh, this is funny. Because you don't know. It's, comedy's tougher, I think, than tragedy. Yeah. You really don't know. It's like, uh-oh, what if nobody laughs? <laughs> and when you hear that laughter going all night and people just, you know, kind of rolling in the aisles, you're like, thank you, Lord. <laughs> you know, that worked. So, I don't know. It's crazy to say, but it's kind of a, a feeling. And then well, the audience reaction. It's... Do you reach a point, I don't know about you, but sometimes I reach a point where I'm like, I'm editing, and I'm like, you know, I don't even know if this is getting better or worse. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of at that point where I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe you can overwrite. You can, you can overwrite. Yes. You can overwrite yourself. It's yeah. like, leave the damn thing alone. <laughs> it's done. You know. So yeah, no, that, I don't know. It's uh, I don't know. I just you kind of know. And and do you find that like with with comedy, it's like like the audience, like the the stage reading process is almost more important because there's so many, you have to tighten up so many jokes, like the timing on it's, things. It's all, oh my God, it's all timing. And of yeah. course that's where actors come to mm -hmm. play. I mean, you can think something's the best joke in the world that you've written. Oh, right. guess what? <laughs> Once you hear somebody say right. it, I'm like, you know, that's not so funny. Or it's like, I need to cut out some words yeah, here. Yeah, I need to, I need to, to take get to the out half the line sooner. Right, right, I need to get yeah, half, yeah, yeah. I've got to get rid of half these lines because sure. it's taking too long to get to the joke. Right, right. So that's where, that's where the process of how you create a play, you know, where it doesn't spring fully done, <laughs> um, you know, that's where that process yeah. is absolutely critical. Yeah. Well, and that's why it's important for people to come to Sips and Scripts, not yes. as only actors reading the play, but as audience members giving feedback on the play. Can I just say that I am in such admiration for what Yvette Holder, you know, that the artistic director of Sips and Scripts is doing. She is a champion for new plays in this area. And we don't have a lot of champions. I'm sorry, I need to say that, you know, and that's a topic for another day, you know, but, but what's happened to new plays in America and what's happened to new plays is it works its way through the theater system, you know, it's changed radically since I first, you know, started my career in theater. And I want to give my, you know, kudos to a vet for really wanting to champion new plays in our area and she's just doing an amazing job and and also a shout out to theater in the park for collaborating right for collaborating with the vet because they're putting you know space and, and and resources available for this and you know I, i'm really grateful to to both those entities yeah. and i think that like it's if people come out to see it like sips and scripts is typically at emerge usually and then this is a little more polished for most sips and scripts yeah, evenings exactly and yeah i mean everything uh, for the sips and scripts everything like if people do come out to it you know know that it's not like per, per it's not finalized work it's a work in progress and that's a, but but it's almost more important for people to come out and give feedback and be present for stuff when it's, it's in progress than it is where it's like like you know it's just as important if not more absolutely because you're really shaping that work and that's absolutely. that's really great stuff absolutely and be part of the process mm -hmm. yeah and that's absolutely kind of exciting and the audience, and this immersive you yeah. know everybody wants hands-on immersive experiences right. this is as pretty much hands-on and immersive as it gets the audience is absolutely an essential part of that for yeah. especially for for drafts and for stuff where it's like the author is like okay this is good enough I'm, I'm ready for for someone to hear it but maybe it isn't like already it's not finalized it's not finished and because because that's where that feedback from a live audience can absolutely. be so critical yeah absolutely. So what is next for both of you? I know you have South Stream and you have probably lots of other plays uh, in the well, works. <laughs> I do. Um, so I, when I say recently, I mean just a few months ago. Um, for the last year and a half, I, I, I worked on Birds and another play kind of at the same time. Because they're radically different. If they were similar, I probably couldn't do it. 
Um, but the play that I, that I just finished, and it had an unstaged reading, um, and a shout out to Country Bookshop, um, which I have a relationship with for the last few years, where I, I take something pretty raw, um, and, I, and the bookstore, you know, sponsors a reading. Of and where my, is that? That's in Southern Pines. Okay. Oh. Next to the Weymouth Center for the Arts and Humanities, uh, which is a place uh, I've done a lot of residencies. And, and they have a really interesting arts community there, too. Oh, my God, too. it's wonderful. Yeah. So yeah. shout out to them. Shout yeah. out to them. So anyway, <laughs> I've been working on this play. It's called Little Women. Um, and it's not women the word, it's women the symbol. <laughs> oh. And it's a look at, it, it's really a very personal work um, about my, my, fam my family, a family of women, um, circa 1963 to 1973, set against the second wave feminist movement in New York City. Um, and it's, a, it's been a really uh, fascinating play to work on. You know, something very personal, but yes, I think this play, I'm not going to say it's political, but it, it has a lot of reverberations that, that surround it in terms of the, the, this family of women and their journey to be free.